Hello and welcome to this Blackwell Online podcast. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is social historian David Kiniston. David has embarked on a major multi-volume project to write the social history of Britain between the end of the Second World War and Margaret Thatcher's coming to power in 1979. The first book in the series, Austerity Britain, was both a critical and commercial success when it appeared a couple of years ago. And his latest volume, Family Britain, which looks at the years 1951 to 1957, shows every sign of repeating that success. I began by asking David why he had called the book Family Britain. I I think there were two two main thoughts at the back of my mind. One was in the sense of Britain as a whole. I remembered a passage by George Orwell that I read as a boy, I think, in his um, essay, The Lion and the Unicorn, Mm. written early in the Second World War. In which, which was about England rather than Britain, but he described the English as, as being um, like a family, except with the wrong members of the family in charge. Mm. And I was, in a way, wanting in this book to see in the 50s how cohesive or not we were as a, as a society, how much like, like a family we were or not. So there's that larger sense of, of, of family, but there's also, of course, the more if you like, con- con- conventional sense of family, the nuclear family, which was in the 50s being very pushed very hard as the sort of, you know, the solution to our problems and, the, and for, for a better way forward and so on. Great um, uh, hopes invested in, in, ch- in children at, the, at this time after the war and the desire of people to return to normality and, and so on. And I wanted to explore the tension, particularly as, as played out in family life, in as much as I could explore it, which is sometimes quite difficult to get the sources, but the tension, mm-hmm. the tension between aspirations uh, and the sort of official and semi-official rhetoric, for example, in women's magazines, on the one hand, about family life, and on the other hand, of course, the realities, which could be rather different from, 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 from the rhetoric and the aspirations. I mean, you refer to the um, the trio of concerns of food, jobs, and home, and I think that yes. that neatly sort of sums up the fact that that life was really still pretty difficult for lots of people in the 1950s. It was difficult, and although things were getting easier, they weren't getting sort of you know, dramatically easier. I mean, at the very end of the, the period in 1957 itself, Macmillan made his famous speech, you know, "Never had it so good," and he was probably right. But that wasn't to say that life was spectacularly easy for, for, for everybody, and that was far, far from it. So it was kind of incremental progress during the 50s, and certainly actually the great expansion of, of white goods, mm. uh, washing machines, uh, for, 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 for example, fridges. That great expansion actually was late, uh, late 50s, early 60s, rather than the, the period I've been dealing with. I mean, it was increasing, but only gradually. Ditto with car ownership, actually. It was, mm. it was increasing, but the great explosion of car ownership comes a little bit later. And, I mean, even with very basic things like the rationing of food, I mean, that was being mm. dismantled, but it was at the beginning of your period, it was yes. still ongoing. It was there for three years. It, the ration didn't finally get abolished until the summer of, of 1954, you know, nine years after the end of the war. I mean, that's a you know, terribly long time, it, it seems to me. Now, tell me a little bit about your technique for actually mm. writing history, because, mm. I mean, it's like a mosaic, really. You're building up yeah, a very yes. big, complicated picture from, from little, yes. small units, tiles. Yes, it is really like a mosaic or a big juice or puzzle or something. I mean, I think I, I try to combine in, in the books you know, great thickness of, of, of texture. One model for that, actually, are those sort of Victorian genre paintings of the mid-19th century. I'm particularly thinking of Frith and his mm. painting Derby Day, you know, with a great sort of you know, enormous amount of, of, of detail in it. And it's trying to get a sort of close and, and intimate to, to everyday, everyday life experiences of people as possible, often through using either mass observation as a source or, 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 or diaries as a source or, or contemporary press. At the same time, trying to sort of keep a certain narrative going mm. so that the whole thing doesn't get completely sort of bogged down and overwhelmed by detail. And in some sense, it's, uh, you know, quite large parts of the book really trying to write a sort of chronicle of the, of the period. At times, this particular episodes or whatever, for example, at the end of Suez, and on sort of a day-to-day, day-by-day kind of basis, but sort of showing the extent to which even on, say, during the Suez crisis, other things are going on and taking people's attention up. Like, for example, during Suez, Marilyn Monroe had been filming The Prince and the Showgirl with Laurence mm. Olivier, and, and, and that was, you know, her, her in, in Britain was very much part of the sort of popular press and was probably kind of occupying as, you know, as, as, as much reading time 
in the popular press as you know as as, as Suez was. So trying to combine that balance of thickness of texture and and, and a sort of bit of narrative push as well. I also wondered if you wanted to challenge or at least test some of the myths and the received opinions about the 50s being an innocent age, an entirely cohesive age, about working yes. class solidarity and so on. What was that? Was that part of your project too? I, I think that's in a sense part of my larger project as far as the 50s specifically is wanting to test those myths particularly. I think about about collect, about collectivism as it were mm. and, and, and the idea of society as a, as a collective and the idea of community this very strong notion that exists that, you know, once there was a time when we really had community before, you know, before slum clearance and before mass immigration and before, you know, greater prosperity and, you know, all sorts of social economic change, Mm. you know, that can be quite a powerful myth. And I did want to sort of try to deconstruct these things. And and very important to me when I was doing my first book, Austerity Britain, researching particularly mass observation material both during and after the war when one, one thinks of the 40s as particularly sort of co- the most collective decade i guess in 20th century britain well perhaps it was but actually looking at this this material i was struck by the prevailing individualism of people mm. and that on the whole they were interested in themselves their immediate families and in a sense not much else and it made me sort of then think about the sort of the long, sort of a long durée of British history mm. since the war through, in a sense, to the present. And but whereas perhaps back in the 1980s, I like I think many other people had seen Thatcher coming in 79 and then winning two more elections and so much changing under her as being somehow sort of against the grain of British society. I've actually now more come to feel that and this is not a value judgment either for or against. Thatcher and Thatcherism, but I've now come to, to feel that in terms of, in terms of as it were, the grain, she was rather more with the long-term grain of British mm. society than I had than I had realised. And one could argue, and I think I'd always be tempted to argue, that the surprise is that it took as long as it did for, as it were, a Thatcher-like figure to, to, to emerge. To someone who grew up in a later decade, I was mm. very struck by the tenacity of the class system. It seemed that the class system yes. pervaded all aspects of life. It so did. It did pervade all aspects. I mean, even, you know, at the level of, of, of sport in cricket, you still had the distinction, which existed up to 1962, between amateurs and, and professionals. And so you'd have the annual match at Lords between the uh, gentlemen and the players. Class was fantastically pervasive in, uh, well, in industry, certainly, uh, in the city of London, which is an area that I've studied a lot before. It was everywhere. And although in terms of any sort of movement, towards a more meritocratic society, something was starting to happen, just starting to happen, as a result of the Butler Act of 1944, which, um, the Education Act, which opened up the grammar schools to everybody, dependent, of course, on passing the 11 plus. And that, that generation of, 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 as it were, Butler's children would start really sort of coming through as, well, starting to come through as adults by around the mid 50s, late 50s, early 60s, you know, an actor like Tom Courtney would be a mm. good, good example of that. Just a little bit later than where I am at the moment, so I guess he's he's for, for, for the next book. But even so, the fact was that was just for very few children. Even within grammar schools, those who got to grammar schools, those who passed 11 plus, the middle class children, I mean, dis- were a disproportionately as well represented in grammar schools vis a vis working class children, and and b within the grammars themselves actually fared much better and so often talented talented working class children uh, were forced to leave school and get a job because their parents simply couldn't see the point of it and there's you know there's much evidence to, to that effect and of course there was the what has to be seen as the failure of the secondary moderns where you know roughly two thirds to three quarters mm. of children went at, at, um, at the secondary stage and it's quite easy to see what the forces were for, for you know for the for the drive towards comprehensivization that really of course took effect in the sixties and seventies.